Good evening. As I said earlier, I'm Eric Miller. I'm the United States Attorney for Vermont. And what that means is my office, the United States Attorney's Office, is the outpost of the United States Department of Justice here in Vermont. And so I really appreciate being invited, Attorney General. Any changes that Vermont makes in its laws or its practices won't have a direct effect on the work that we do in the federal system, but I'm confident that we will learn a lot from you tonight that will help guide us in our continuing efforts to make the federal criminal justice more fair, more equitable, and I hope that by sharing a little bit about the federal system, it'll provide some context for the changes that the state may be contemplating in the upcoming session. I think most of us associate being convicted of a federal crime with going to prison for a really long time. And there are a couple reasons why we make that association. Number one, sentences in the federal system have been determined in the first instance, calculated in the first instance, by reference to something called the federal sentencing guidelines, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And in drug cases, those premise a sentence primarily on the quantity of drugs involved in the underlying offense. The other reason we associate being in the federal system with long prison sentences is something called mandatory minimum sentences. There are certain charges in the federal system that carry with them 5, 10, 15, 20 year mandatory sentences. And for much of the last two and a half, three decades, sentences in federal cases in many, but not all states, have been driven in large part by those two factors. Um, the result is predictable, right? An explosion in the number of people serving federal time. I recently read that by 2010, one third of the Department of Justice's budget went to the Bureau of Prisons to incarcerate people. Now, I expect that tonight there'll be a lot of discussion about whether Vermont can save money by relying less on incarceration, and then making sure that money gets used to address the same problems in a more effective way, through treatment, through education, for different types of law enforcement. In the federal system, we have a wonderful example of the connectedness of those budgets. The Department of Justice houses the Bureau of Prison, the DEA, the FBI, federal prosecutors, and all sorts of programs that provide education, reentry, and problem-solving courts. And as a result, if you save money by incarcerating fewer people or people for a shorter amount of time, you are contributing money to a budget that can be used for other more effective tools to combat, for instance, drug addiction, the underlying source of many of the problems that law enforcement deals with. Recognizing all of this, two years ago in 2013, under Attorney General Eric Holder, continuing under Attorney General Loretta Lynch, the department launched something they call Smart on Crime. And the notion is that being smart on crime is also being tough on crime. It recognizes that, as TJ mentioned, there are going to be serious offenders, violent offenders, for whom prison sentences will remain appropriate. But at the same time, our experience has told us that low-level offenders, nonviolent offenders, incarcerating them for long periods of time actually doesn't make us safer and instead contributes to a cycle of poverty, criminality, incarceration, recidivism, while at the same time draining resources from other potentially more effective tools to combat these same problems. As a result, the Department of Justice is doing a number of things differently. I'll talk about just a couple here. First, we as prosecutors are coming at this awesome power we have to choose criminal charges differently. And we have been instructed to reserve charges carrying mandatory minimum sentences for only the most serious and the most violent offenders that we deal with. Second, 
we have been told to take a much more individualized approach to our sentencing recommendations, not a mechanical approach that looks solely at one factor, for instance, the amount of drugs involved in the crime, but assessing risk, assessing need, assessing rehabilitation, assessing how we can avoid recidivism, and building all of those things into our sentencing recommendations in federal court. And then finally, we're devoting resources to things that are not the traditional prosecutions that federal, uh, that assistant United States attorneys do. We are investing our time and our energy in problem solving courts, frankly courts that the state has had for much longer than the federal system has. We have a brand new this year federal drug court that's run by uh, Judge Jeffrey Crawford down in Rutland. And then second, we have a reentry court that has been run for several years by Magistrate Judge uh, Conroy here in Burlington. And we are putting prosecutorial resources into, on the front end, drug court, which holds the prospect of avoiding any incarceration whatsoever for low-level drug offenders. And we're investing resources on the back end on reentry to help people coming out of jail adjust better to lives on the outside and hopefully work with them on the things that we know matter so much, housing, jobs, addiction treatments, so that we can drive down the rates of recidivism, understanding that together these things will help make our communities a little bit safer. Those are some of the things we're doing at the federal level and I will tell you this, after decades of relying on mandatory minimum sentences and mechanically applied sentencing guidelines at least in some districts. If the Department of Justice can make these changes, any state that decides to do the same, I think, uh, can move even further in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you very much.